May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. Dearly beloved in the Lord, uh, <clears throat> may the hearing of God's word be to our hearts, a uh, 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 stilling of the heart, inform our minds, and transform our hearts. Am I being heard? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't. I can tell. Uh, would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 32? Exodus chapter 32, the passage that was just read to us right now. And uh, Sunday school kids, what is the passage about? What did the uh, nation of Israel build? Is that Sunday school kids here or not? Yes. A golden calf. Yeah, this is about the golden calf. This is about idol worship. And uh, so as part of our series, Road to Emmaus, we've been looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. Where, if, As Jesus was talking to the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, he would speak to them from the law, the prophets, and the psalm. And so we've been looking to see what is it that Jesus would have spoken about from this particular passage. So we want to see Jesus. And we will also see three principles that we can use in our life, and it's called the idols in the wilderness, the idols in our wilderness. And here's a takeaway. This is something that I'd like us to remember. We are worshipers by design, but idol addicts in sin and need a divine rescue. We are worshipers by design. God designed us so that we will be worshipers. But because of sin, we worship idols, idols that we make. We are idol addicts. And so therefore, we need to be rescued. That is going to be the premise of what we will look at today. But let me just pray before we start. Father, I pray that the hearing of your word would uh, transform our lives. We need to hear your word for from for, for because of the hearing of your word that comes faith. And so may it be, O oh God, that in hearing your word, we, are, we have understood what it means to believe in this God and to have Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name, amen, amen. Now, this is found in the book of Exodus. Exodus can be divided into two parts. Uh, two parts. The first part is the knowledge of Yahweh God. Remember the time we, we touched on it also this morning when Moses went and said, let my people go. Pharaoh would say, who is this God? And so the, the premise of that first part of that book is this, that this is the Lord God. The Yahweh God, he says, the Egyptians will know, Israel will know, who is this God? And then you have the second part, which is the presence of God. We speak about how God would come and dwell in the midst of his people. Uh, we see how the tabernacle is be being built, the instruction for the tabernacle. So you have the knowledge of God, and when you have the knowledge of God, leading to the presence of God with us and between uh, dwelling in the midst of his people. And these two are joined together by Exodus 15. Anybody tell me what is Exodus 15? Exodus 15 is the song of Moses, the, the song that they sing after they cross over the Red Sea. And when you read the, uh, the, uh, that chapter, Exodus 15, you will see how both of those come together beautiful. The first half, he, you see the, the, who God is. He shows himself as a powerful God, as the almighty God. And then the second part, we see because of this God, we see the presence, the, the way that he is going to take care of them. He's going to shepherd them. And, and so we are on the second part. That is where we are in chapter 32. We are in the second part where th there's this conversation about how God would dwell in the midst of his people. A and right there, 
in 32, the way this is placed, this is just wonderful. We will touch on that as we go through. But the three principles that I want to bring to your attention, the first one is we become like the idols that we worship. And that's the first half of the reading that we have. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 10. We become like the idols that we worship. It's not been more than 40 days since they saw the presence of God on Mount Sinai. And they said, this is Lord God. They acknowledged who God is. And they get into this covenantal, uh, uh, into a covenant with this God. And in less than 40 days, they fall into idolatry. When you look at this passage in this verses 1 to 10, and a little more, you will see that there are very similar comparisons to the first time sin entered humanity. And where was that? Which chapter is that? Genesis chapter 3. So if you were to compare Genesis 3 and what we read here in Exodus 32, you can get at least seven comparisons. And let's look at that. So let's look at verse 1. When people saw that Moses delayed, remember the word saw? Eve saw is the same word that is being used. So when the woman saw, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And here's something that we can remember. Our ungodly desires often grow from ungodly looks. When we look at things that we are not supposed to look at, it creates in us this ungodly desires, and ungodly desires leads to idols. Idol is a result of ungodly desires. You might think that, oh, I don't have idols, but we will touch on that. How desire that is not godly can lead to idols. Verse 2, look at the second thing that is... Uh, that can be compared. So uh, Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold. This worship of idol is expensive, is eternally expensive. You might think that, you know, that's okay if I have idols and, you know, I, I have some interest and some, some things that I like and they become your idol. And you might think that's okay, but God's word will show you that these idols can be eternally expensive. You might think I'm just trading a few gold coins or silver coins, but it can be tremendously expensive. So that little choice, that, that desire that Adam and Eve, or Eve in the first case, had to be like God, that, that desire and the choice that she makes, what a cost that the humanity has had to pay after that. Verse 4, look at verse 4 for the next one. And he received the gold, and, and um, so, so he then makes into a golden calf. The, the graven tool, he made a golden calf. Uh, this reminds us of a base nature of sin. In Genesis 3, also there was a beast. What was a beast? The serpent. And here you have a calf. And we will touch later to see how this is quite, uh, what we can understand of this beast that we have, the calf and the, uh, the serpent. We come down to verse 5. We see in verse 5 that tomorrow, Aaron says, you shall, a feast, you shall have a feast to the Lord. Again, do you see a comparison with Genesis 3? They try to have a feast which is not the right feast. They, had a, they preferred a dangerous feast when, when Eve took of that fruit and ate of it. The one thing that God had told them not to do, that's what they had. They preferred that. God, in fact, had offered them a greater feast. He said, you can eat of anything in this garden, in Eden, except that one thing. That is prohibited. But they reach out and take that. And that we see here, even though it's called the feast to the Lord, it's offered before the idols. And, and so, you, so this feast is not the right feast. It's an ungodly feast. It's not a feast that is for the glory of God. 
In fact, earlier on in chapter 30, uh, um, in 24, Exodus 24, you read from verses 10 to 11 that God had invited these elders to come up and to have a feast in his presence. God is a God who throws a feast, or throws a party. In fact, it says that every time someone comes to know God, there is a, there's a party, there's a feast in the presence of God. So God throws a party. But our desire, because of our idols and the sin addiction that we have, is that we prefer the wrong feast. Now, flip over in my page, I flip over, but verse 23, you see another one. Verse 23, Aaron is asked, like, why did you do this? And he tells Aaron, you know these people, uh, the kind of people that they are. And so there is blame that happens. Sin does that. Remember, Adam was asked, like, why did he do it? And he blamed Eve, this woman that you gave. Sin does not accept culpability. It's always someone else. It's pointing fingers to someone else. And that is what sin does. You think you're okay, and that is the deception of sin. Sin will always make you think you're good and right, and the problem is somewhere else. And then in verse 25, you go to verse 25, you see what is happening there is that is there is shame and there is nakedness because that word broken loose and the word derison, derison is shame. Remember again when sin first entered the garden in Eden, there was shame and nakedness. And sin does just that. Verse 27 when you get down to verse 27, you put a sword to your side, each of you, and go forth and kill. There's a killing that happens. There's a representative death. That day, 3,000 people died. Now, you might think, well, that's a lot of people who died, but that's only representative because sin should have killed everybody. And the punishment of sin is death for everybody. But it's representative. It's only 3,000. God had told Adam and Eve that the day that you eat of this fruit, you will die. And they did spiritually. They would die in the soul on a daily basis. But their physical death was delayed so that they are able to accept grace, which God gives to them. All right? But verse 29, there is relational cost, relational death, sorry, relational death. They turned on each other, the cost of son and his brother, that they might bestow a blessing. And remember, Cain turned on Abel. Uh, why am I doing this? So that you understand the pattern of sin is the same. But there is something beautiful in verse 20. In verse 20, where the calf is burnt with fire and ground to powder and scattered, this calf is destroyed, it's ground up, it's crushed. And that is the promise that Adam and Eve received, that this serpent, the head of the serpent would be crushed. And that's the story that we've been following through. We've been trying to see this promise that has been given to us, the serpent, we're waiting for the serpent crusher. And so when, when you read this verse 20, we have hope that this is not uh, just God giving up everything or just, just discarding us. Oftentimes we ask ourselves this question, how could they do this? How could Israel have made an idol like this right like within 40 days? They worshipped an idol. But the truth is this, every time we prefer the blessing more than the blessor, every time we think that what God has gifted us with, blessed us with, we enjoy that, enjoy that in isolation with our thanks uh, directed towards God, we have a problem. That is, I prefer the blessing rather than God himself. And that can become an idol. So there could be certain things in your life that God has blessed you with, and that could have become an idol. A good thing becoming an ultimate thing. The things that you prefer over and above everybody else and anything else, something that your heart craves for, could all be idol. So it's not a physical idol, a golden calf, but we all 
are prone to worshiping idols in our sin. Someone said, we are, our minds are idol factories. We're making up own idols in our own mind because we want to worship who we want to worship. And, keep, and, and, and so when you keep that, this, this, this idea that we are no better than uh, the nation of Israel, then the lessons from this chapter become real for us. One other thing that we have to ask as I set this up as we continue is why was a calf, why a golden calf? A question would be asked, like why a golden calf? Why a calf? To something else, like a creative thing. So uh, let me give you three possibilities. One is it's imaged after the Egyptian god of fertility called Apis. It's, a, uh, it's like a calf that they had seen in, in Egypt. And so the information about this is kept in, uh, in, in Australian Museum. They've actually found this, uh, that they would worship in a calf. And maybe because they've seen that, uh, so they would, they would make an image of the calf. But that calf was an intermediary. That is, this, this epis was supposed to be a mediator, mediating between man and God. And maybe they thought, now Moses is God, so we need a mediator. We need somebody to approach God. And so therefore the feast of the Lord, possibility. But second possibility is that they made a God who has the likeness of a livestock. Somebody who, something that can be domesticated. Uh, we need gods who can be domesticated, who work to our plans. When we make our idols, we make them in our image. We make gods in the way that will listen to us. We can manipulate this God. And so maybe the calf would represent that, a God who can be domesticated, a God who is safe, does not make demands. One of the things that, as you read this chapter 32 and compare earlier on when they had to, to come before God, they had to consecrate themselves in chapter 20 and, and 21 and 22. We'll see how for three days they had to consecrate them, so they had to set aside, they had to prepare to come before this living God, otherwise they would die. But here in this case, you just get up and feast and, and do what you want, there's no expectation. And so, a God who is an easy God on us is the God that we like. But I said, we become like the idols that we worship, so if you will turn to verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9 says that they have become stiff-necked. I've seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Where do you get that phrase stiff-necked from? They understood that it's about the calf. Listen to me. It's about the calf who would not do what the owner is asking you to do. The ox, the, the, the one that has got the yoke, they're stiff-necked. This is the first time this expression stiff-necked is used. And it will continue to be used for the nation of Israel, for God's people, that they are stiff-necked. And so they are becoming like the calf that they are worshiping. In Psalm 135, verse 18, it says, those who make them become like them, and so all who trust in them. We become like the irrational animal, the beast, the dumb, irrational beast, and that is what we saw even uh, when we were in Genesis chapter 3 and chapter 4, that the serpent, wa serpent was the beast, in that case, the creeping thing. By Genesis 4, Cain was actually behaving like the serpent taking lives. And so, remember, you become like the idol that you worship. In Israel... We remember Israel had longed, they had longed to go back to Egypt. 
they, they thought those leeks and garlic and onions and all of that, they wanted that. They wanted to go back into slavery. That's the, the innate sin desire in us. In, in the New Testament, think about this. Think about the prodigal son who's just come back. When he was in the far off land, he was offered food that he was not even offered. They, he, they refused giving him food that would have been given to the pigs. That, that should have been given to the pigs. And so now he is back home in, 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 you know, with the family and, and he sits there and now he's longing for those days of, oh, if only I could eat that food, the pig's food. That would be the state of what an idol worship does to the children of God. Longing for things that are so terrible. So it makes you like the idol that we worship. But listen to the second principle. From verse 11 onwards, we see the second principle. The second principle is this, that we become like the God we worship. We become like the God that we worship. Look at Moses. There are two contrasting things about Moses that we see. In verses 11 to 13, we see how he intercedes for the people of God, for this nation that has just sinned. In verse 11, it says, relent from your wrath, O God. Verse 12, resist for the sake of your glory. Your, you know, people would say, you brought them out to kill them, so resist for your glory. In verse 13, remember your covenant. Remember, O oh God, you got into a covenant with them. Don't destroy them. And yet, when you turn to verse 19, Moses, verse 19, his anger burned hot, and he threw the ta tablets out of his hands, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Moses understood, understood that interceding for the people is not, does not mean ignoring their sin. Interceding for God's people does not mean that you ignore sin. Sin has to be addressed. Sin has to be confronted. Sin has to be rebuked. But you intercede for them. And these two coming together is what we see in God. And we see how Moses is now the one who was worshiping, was in the presence of God, is now reflecting the character of of God, right? And so um, the, in verse 20, we see what is happening there. He, he took the calf and he burnt it with fire. Like, look at the passion with which he does that. He, he burns it to, with fire. He grounds it into powder and scatters it on the water and makes the people drink of it. Now you might think, like, what? That is, like, what is Moses doing? But if you follow the story, when you get to Numbers chapter 5, uh, when it speaks about addressing a sin, that's exactly what they'll be doing. They'll be grinding and drinking of it in the sin of adultery. Or Jeremiah, when he speaks about uh, uh, punishment for sin, that they are made to drink of, of the idols that they worship, which is ground up. Or purification, that's another example that we see later. Uh, of the red heifer. So you have the punishment and the purification symbolized in this place as Moses makes them drink of that ground up idol. This continuing grace, that's the beauty. That's the wonder of a God. He, he, he just continues to pursue us. And so in verse 26, it says, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and says, who is on the Lord's side? I, I, I uh, debated whether this should be the title of this sermon, who is on the Lord's side? I think that's the question that we ask. Who is on the Lord's side? Of this God who will not stand for sin and yet shows grace and mercy. Who's on the Lord's side? I heard Tim Keller say this example, and I thought it was just phenomenal. Imagine a man and a woman courting, and they want to get married. So they meet up, and they're having this discussion, and the girl says, 
uh, you know, I'm allergic to pets, and so I cannot have pets. So please, uh, you know, we need to think about it. And the man says, you know what, I, 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 I want to have two dogs and two cats. And so, I, you know, I, 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 I'm going to have dogs and I'm going to have cats. The woman says, uh, you know, you make good money, I make good money, but we should live within our means and not spend more money. The man says, no, 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 that's, you know what, I, I, I like to live uh, life king size and spend as much money, no problem, because we only live once, YOLO. And then he goes on and says, you know, we, we, should, we should have two kids. And the man says, no, 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 I don't want any kids. I don't want any kids. Kids come in the way. Uh, and then he gets on the knees and proposes to her and said, you know what? It doesn't matter. Whatever you think, whatever I think, doesn't matter. We just love each other. So let's just get married. But the question is asked, if we get into such a marriage, will that marriage last? No. No. Uh, we have been fed the lie of this world saying that it's only love that matters, that God is love, and so that is enough. And that does not work that way. God, a relationship, works on laws and expectations. And so you saw here in this how there is a means and a way of working things out together. And love is therefore held within this law. And that is what God is saying. You getting into a relationship with me? There are certain laws that are safe for you. Don't, don't think law is contrary to love. It's because of law, God's law, that this love is safe. And so this God that we want to be conformed to in the image of his son is a God who is a loving God, but a God who gives the laws that we would, we would uh, be safe. Law cannot save you. That's the gospel. The law is not removed completely. And then when you get to the New Testament, we see how the civic laws uh, or the moral laws, uh, the moral laws are still there, but the ceremonial laws, uh, they're not necessary anymore because the sacrifice is already done. But it does not mean that we can go killing each other or lying or stealing, right? We are not devoid of that moral part of God. And so this, this idea here is that we become like the God that we worship. We become like the idol that we worship or we become like the God that we worship. Certainly not perfectly, not perfectly, but in a very profound way. So turn with me to Exodus 34 and 6 and see what, what we see there, 34 and 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. His blessing is for a long time. We see that later, even up to the thousand generation. And here we see a God who visits sin. He, that is the character of this God. We, uh, when we talk about who our God is, right? So we become like the idols we worship or we become like the God that we worship. We have a choice. And that brings us to the third principle that our idols and our alternatives are inadequate. We read that in the third part. Our idols and our uh, alternatives are inadequate because now there is sin. Sin needs to be atoned. There needs to be something done with sin. And so in verse 30, what we see is that uh, idols have failed and Moses now tries to intercede. And he says, perhaps, in verse 30, perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. And so in verse 32, as Moses goes up, he tells God, and now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Right, I'll be the substitute. I'll stand for their sin. 
That is what Moses is saying. They have sinned, God. We know they have sinned. We acknowledge that. But let me come as an alternative and take their place. In verse 33, we read that whoever has sinned against me, whoever sinned against me, I will blot out, out of my book. So Moses' substitution is not acceptable. It's inadequate. And, um, and so verse 35, we see then that there is a plague on the people. God sends a plague on the people. Uh, but it appears as if that judgment is not passed, as if, as if the plague, the, the, uh, the uh, plague, the judgment of plague is passed, but it's not executed, it's not fallen, it's still as if it's lingering, okay? And, and so what's happening till now, at this point, is people are trying to make up their own gods, they're trying to make up their own mediators, and all of them fail. And this chapter ends right there. It says there's a plague on the people because they made the calf and one that Aaron made. And then in verse 33, there's a command to leave Sinai. It's almost as if it's left halfway, hanging without a solution. And so something needs to be done. What do we do with this plague hanging over their head? That's the question as, as we proceed on. And thankfully, even though the chapter might end, which is, we know it's not the inspired way of breaking up chapters, the Bible does not end. It goes on to tell the redemptive story. It tells us about uh, what God has done. All right? And so we know, we know that all through all of history, man has tried to make God for himself in his own image. And till the time God comes in the likeness of man, in the image of man, as it were, there is no solution. There's no substitution. And that, that is what we know is Jesus Christ who comes in the likeness of man. He comes in the form of a servant born in the likeness of man. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. If somebody could represent us, it's not Moses, it's not someone else, it has to be God. Only God can represent us to God. And that is what we see in Jesus. In Jesus, we have the only divine rescue. The only divine rescue, the one who came for us. In Jesus, we have the perfect high priest. Unlike Aaron, who actually made the people to to sin and took them away from God, we have Jesus Christ, the perfect high priest who takes us away from sin and brings us to God. In Jesus, we have the perfect mediator. Moses tries to mediate, but he is inadequate. That epis, the golden calf, was inadequate. It's not a mediator that can come before God. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, we see how there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is this Jesus who comes in the likeness of man. Be Therefore we sing the song, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, and I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thus depart. That is the God we worship. That's the Jesus who came down as us. He's the one who was crushed for our iniquities. Not un un unlike that idol that was crushed. That idol was crushed and they were made to drink of it. And what they received was death. But Jesus Christ who was crushed for our iniquities because of his death, because he was crushed, we get to live today as we trust him. He is the one who was given to his people to live and to, to eat and to live. We read that in John chapter 6. The bread from heaven. Eat of my body and drink of my blood, he says, which means to have this intimate relationship to know who Jesus is. No idol can ever replace that. And in verse 35, that plague, that was, the judgment was passed, but not executed. We know on the cross it fell on Jesus. 
and because of the wrath fell on Jesus, because all, all of that that was reserved for you when you trust Jesus fell on Jesus, uh, was reserved for you, fell on Jesus, sorry, we know that there's no more plague left for us. There's no wrath left for us, only blessings. He's the one who brings us salvation. On that Mount Sinai that night, that day, because of death, because of idol worship, 3,000 people died. Listen to me, girls. Listen to me, Sunday school. 3,000 people died. 3,000 people died. 3,000 people died. And yet, on that day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost when the church was born, 3,000 people are saved. That is the power of the work of cross by our Lord Jesus Christ that brings life to those who are dead through his death, but he lives forever. That's the joy. That's the God that this passage is turning our attention to. So the choice that we have is, who do we turn to, the golden calf or the glorious Christ? Oh, glorious Christ indeed. Amen. Not the golden calf. The golden calf it cannot do anything. It, it looks all good on the outside. But it's only the glorious Christ that kept his promise. From Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the serpent crusher has come. He has come to crush the head of the serpent. He was bruised, but being bruised, he lives. On the third day, he rose again. Jesus Christ. And so the best decision that you can choose, make a choice, is to choose this glorious Christ and not make idols of your own. To have, and it's a right thing to pay the cost that is required because as the Levites, we read in verse 29, where they paid the cost, they were willing to put to death people who did not turn to God. And we don't do that right now, but what we do is turn the sword to us to put to death, to modify the flesh because it's your flesh that is standing against God. We recognize that Jesus took on human flesh so that your death is not necessary for eternity. But on a daily basis, we put our fleshly desires, our ungodly desires, our, our this desire to run away and make, up our, make our own idols. That would be put to death. And so... I don't know if there's anyone here who does not know Christ or, or, or thinks that they know Christ. Because like we began by saying deception of sin is this, that we think we know it. We know it all in our head. We, we are informed but not transformed. It's not changed us. Uh, information does nothing unless this is transforming. And, and God does that. And for you to know that the idols that you have made have failed you. They have left you thirsty and hungry. And they will never satisfy. These are broken systems that you run after. But you hear you have Jesus. You make a choice. It's in the next chapter. We looked at that chapter 34. A God who is both gracious, merciful, and abounding. And it's his glory that Moses would want to see. Even though 3,000 people died, even though Moses recognized that the glory of God is awesome and terrifying, he says, I want to see the glory of God. And God, as we read in 34, 6, he makes uh, his goodness pass before him. The glory of God becoming the goodness of God for those who are in Jesus Christ. Only because of Jesus Christ. Let me read to you verse 9, ch uh, chapter 34, verse 9. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, let the Lord go in our midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. Moses stops placing himself as the Savior of Israel. He's, he recognizes he cannot be the mediator. Only God 
Only God can be the mediator. May that be true for us. So if, we, if you would please stand with me. I want to give you about 30 seconds to introspect your own life, to say, do we make idols for ourselves? Is there, are there priorities in our life that has taken the place of God? Is, is something in our life so preeminent, so important that we can't do without? Maybe you're looking for a job and you say, oh, I want this job, Lord, I want this job. And you pray to God, you want his blessing, but you don't need God. Or you may be those who have the information on the head, but it does not really know, uh, you don't really know what it means for the Spirit of God to have changed your life. I plead with you not to play with the goodness of God because it, it, it is an awesome thing. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of God, of a holy God. And so if there are idols that you have been raising, you take a look at yourself. Maybe you look like one of those idols already. But you have a choice that you can make. No, I want to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, where I pursue holiness and I love people because they're made in the image of God. And Jesus, who teaches me to love my enemies. So I make a choice today, oh Lord, I make a choice. You would, you would pray. I want to make a choice. Break my idols, take away my sin. I believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross. The wrath of God that was reserved for me has fallen on him. His righteousness is now given to me. So that when God looks at me, he looks as me, at me as the, as the very son of God, draped, clothed in, in his righteousness. So I thank you, God. Thank you for this, dear people. Thank you, Lord, that your grace has been abundant, your mercies uh, new every morning, and as we reminded ourselves, the steadfast love of the Lord is forever. And so, in your benevolence, you have blessed us. In your mercy, in your grace, you have given us, Lord, a lot. More than we desire, more than we deserve. But this morning, we want to pause. And we want to say, Lord, I want to choose you over anything and everything. For you alone are worthy of all honor, all glory, all praise. You alone are the one who keeps the promise. You alone are the one who is coming back for me and coming back for us. And so help us, Lord, to live the life that brings glory to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you again. Thank you for all the heads that are bowed and for the work of grace that is happening in their lives. Be glorified, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.